All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here to give the, the big picture, I guess, the, the 50,000 foot view of salinization of, of waters in the Adirondack Park by road salt. So I'd like to start by really acknowledging the groups that we've been working with over the years. Uh, like a lot of, I think like a lot of really meaningful efforts, our work on road salt really started at the grassroots level. And for the Institute, that meant that we worked with the Adirondack, or ADK Action, they actually con and actually the Adirondack Council, who both contracted with us to, do, to develop a literature review. So my colleague, Corey Laxon, and I dove into the literature and found out what we could find out about road salt uh, from, from the literature and other, and other sources. And, and we realized, as part of that review, it was like, wow, you know, we actually have a lot of information at our disposal locally, so we can take a look at this issue uh, with local data within the Adirondacks. And so that, that was the seed for us, and it, our work has grown to include a number of organizations, including funding from the state, from the federal government, and more participation with other groups. And, and so, like I said, it started at the grassroots level, and it continues to be. We have a, a lot of people we work with in collaboration. So I'd like to start off with my take-home messages, just in case I run out of time. Uh, so first, we use a lot of salt on our roads in the Adirondacks. And I think if you haven't seen these numbers, you'll be pretty amazed. Second is that salt has resulted in regional salinization of our, we know of our lakes and our streams and probably our groundwater resources as well. Third, that salt is having impacts on our ecosystems. It could be having impacts on human health through groundwater contamination and folks that have individual wells. And the fourth take home is simple. If we care about any of these things above it, then we need to act. Because if we continue to load salt into our watersheds, the options for, for uh, mitigation uh, will be fewer and fewer and far between and, and less and less realistic. So let me start off. I'll just quickly talk about what road salt is. It, it's a comes from a naturally occurring mineral called halite. Uh, the chemical formula is sodium chloride, and the symbol is NaCl. It's the same salt you buy in your Morton salt shaker, or if you don't, or maybe your generic alternative that you get at Aldi's, like I do, I'm not sure. Uh, but without the iodine, right? They don't put the iodine in the Morton salt. But it's the same salt that we, that most of us probably use too much of on our food. Uh, Mined, and, so we act, and actually some of the largest salt mines in the world are in the state of New York, down by Syracuse. Uh, if you're a history buff, uh, uh, like I am, you may know that Syracuse is the salt, is the salt city, the Syracuse University that used to be known as the Saltine Warriors before they were the Orange Men. So just recognizing that salt, salt has been king in New York for, for a long time. It is a main source, uh, main source of, of road salt mining, mining in New York. So if you, if you do your own salting on your sidewalks, which a lot of people do, or, or locally in your businesses, you go to the Ace Hardware store and you buy a, a bag of halite, that's what you're buying is, is sodium chloride halite, which as they say on the bag, it melts ice and snow. So we add the salt to solid, of course, granules. You add it to the ice and snow, uh, melts, melts the ice, and now we have water with what we call sodium ions and chloride ions. And the salinization refers to just the increase in the sodium chloride ion co concentrations in the water as a result of adding the salt. So why do we use uh, sodium chloride? Well, it's cheap in quotes. It's naturally occurring. It's very abundant. So it's, it's, it's much cheaper to purchase than a lot of the, most of the other de-icers are artificial, so they have to be manufactured, which costs money to costs a lot of energy to manufacture something that doesn't want to be together naturally. And it's effective, in quotes as well, as long as it's put down at the right temperatures, right, in the, in the right ways. Uh, and it's also cheap if you're not considering the uh, other impacts like on our, our bridges, our guardrails, our cars, the environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of salt use in the Adirondacks, uh, we have a very extensive network of paved roads. So we have 10,555 lane miles of paved roads. For those of you who don't know, a lane mile uh, is a measurement used by, by folks that work on roads. One, uh, one mile of, 
of one of our state routes, like Route 3, Route 30, would have two lane miles for a salt truck because it has to go up one mile and back another. So, the, so that's what lane miles refer to. And it breaks down into, is there a lighter? Really not worth it. Okay. So, 2,830 lane miles of state roads. Those are shown on the map in red. These are our lone interstate, our state routes like uh, 3 and 30, and, and our U.S. highway, like Route 9. Those are all roads that are managed under the jurisdiction, the responsibility of the New York State Department of Transportation. The remaining roads, 7,725 lane miles, the black ones are local roads. These are county roads, town roads, village roads, those all fall in there. So those are under local jurisdiction, local management, and so there's a variety of different ways those roads may be managed in the wintertime. In terms of the annual salt use on these different roads, the state roads receive on average 108,000 tons of salt, and the local roads receive on average 84,700 tons of salt. Now, it's interesting to reflect back and look at the, the lane miles. The state roads, even though they're about a third of the lane miles, they receive more salt than the local roads. And this is because all the state roads are managed using the same protocols. And that involves very high, actually the highest loading rates or application rates of, of road salt for de-icing in, in North America. So every state road lane mile gets treated the same with a small amount of variation. Local roads, some are plowed, some are plowed and sanded with some salt or, or various, various mixtures of sand and salt. Uh, some are plowed and salted. So there's a lot of variability in how local roads are treated versus state roads are consistent. And that's an important point to remember when I show you some results a little bit later. So that's the big picture in terms of salt application. Now, salinization, the process begins with runoff. We're all familiar with this, so if we look at you know, a typical scene in the spring, we've got this sludgy kind of watery area next to the road, where we've all seen that, right? Uh, this is a section of Route 30, just north of Paul Smith. We're looking about a mile of road, so that would have received about 76 tons of salt that winter. And we have this runoff, the snow melt occurring, and if you take a look at that runoff, so we grab, we grab a sample, Corey and Liz grab a, grab a sample, and on that particular spring day, the chloride concentration was 5,000 parts per million. So that's about a quarter of the concentration of seawater. So in, in that, in that, in that uh, water that's coming off the road. This is just one mile, right, of road, and, and we have this happening all over. So this salt is coming, this is the Haysbrook Truck Trail, if you're familiar. It's going to make its way towards the Osgood River. About half of that salt-laden water is going to actually percolate down into the soil where some is going to be retained by the soil itself and the rest will make its way down into groundwater which could either go to surface water or, or accumulate in groundwater of course if folks are drinking that groundwater they have the potential to to interact with that salt through drinking it and the remaining salt will actually go right to the stream so about 50 percent of the of the salt will go to the stream as direct runoff so about 50 percent is direct runoff 50% goes into the soil. This is happening year after year after year. So park-wide, that's about 9, 900, 900, 192,700 tons, there you go, of salt runoff per year. And if we think about this, this uh, practice started back in the Olympics. So this is the Olympic Village, right? So uh, right, right around the time of the Olympics, we started salting aggressively to clear our roads. So almost 7 million tons of sodium chloride have been added to our roads and the Adirondacks since 1980. Uh, put that in perspective, our other major regional pollutant, acid deposition, acidification, sulfate and nitrate, this is about six times more than that. So six times more than the pollutant that's well studied. Uh, so think about that. Uh, here, here's a different statistic. So we look, go back to our little salt, salt bottle. About 23 billion individual salt <coughs> canisters over, over that period. So a lot, a lot of material has been added to our roads. Shows us this is a high degree of interaction between our roads, or connectivity, if you will, between our roads and our waters through runoff. And what this map is showing you is so all the red areas are lakes and streams that actually 
receive runoff from paved roads. So for the Adirondacks, we have about 6,000 miles of streams, which is 52% of the total stream length, receives road, up, road runoff. And for lakes, we have 195,000 acres of lakes, or 77% of the total acres, or 820 water bodies receive, receive road runoff. So it's clear that from the regional perspective, uh, based on the interaction between runoff from roads and the surface water, that there's a potential for large-scale, wide-scale regional contaminate contamination or salinization of our lakes from the salt. If we just kind of look in the local level here, this is our model kind of zooming in on the Lake Placid area. So, so we're up there somewhere. So there's the road network in black. You can see the surface waters. This, whatever color that is, I don't know what color that is, sort of pinkish, blah, barfy color. So this, this is, uh, this is the area, that, this is where the runoff is happening. So the water is moving through these areas. So you can see within the local area, as, uh, as someone else said, this is an urban area, <laughs> urban area in the Adirondacks. So we have a lot of runoff moving to our surface waters in this particular area. And, and Corey and Brennan, of course, will be, be elaborating on that in, our, in, in their talks. So what evidence do we have? So we see the potential, what evidence do we have? Corey, Liz, Jurger, myself, we did an analysis, published it back in 2012, using regional lake data to look at chloride concentrations. So on this map, the red dots are lakes that have uh, paved roads in their watersheds, and the blue dots are lakes that don't have paved roads in, in their watersheds. So we're looking at, at the presence, absence of paved roads as an indicator of salt being in the water body. So the result is, is pretty dramatic and pretty clear. Uh, we're looking at chloride on the y-axis in parts per million, and the blue bar is lakes and watersheds with no paved roads, 56 of those. The red bar, lakes and watersheds with paved roads, 82 of those. And for, so for the lakes and watersheds with no paved roads, so, so they're not receiving any salt, we have less than 0.5 parts per million of chloride. Actually, the average is 0.25 parts per million. Why is that? Well, what, what are the natural sources of chloride? It's either weathering of the rock or it's coming from deposition and precipitation. Uh, our, our geology is essentially devoid of chloride. We have very low chloride in our parent materials and we get very little deposition. So, so our natural chloride is low versus we see about a 14 time higher chloride concentration uh, on average in lakes and watersheds with paved roads. So clearly showing us that there's regional salinization of our lakes across the Adirondacks because those red dots are spread across quite an area. But you can you notice for the red bar, there's a lot of variability there. So, so a, very, a lot of variation, variation around that mean. So what explains that variability? So what we looked at is the density of the roads in the watersheds and we looked at the correlation or the relationship between watershed road density and chloride concentration, and you can see that graphic on the right, clear, a clear positive relationship, so as road density increase, chloride concentration increase. Uh, and not only that, if you look at the, what the x-axis, axis how it's labeled, it, it says state road density, not just road density. And when we actually tried to look at the relationship with ro local road density, we found no relationship between chloride concentration in local road density. Why? Because local roads are treated all different kinds of ways and state roads are all treated the same. So at the regional scale, our conclusion, our conclusion was that our regional salinization of lakes in the Adirondacks is from salt application to state roads. So that was a major conclusion from our project. Now let's, so that's surface water, now let's move to groundwater. So the Adirondacks has a tremendous groundwater resources that many of you probably know. Over 1,600 square miles of what we call unconfined aquifers. And uh, so that's the pink color. And I've overlain the, the contaminated surface water in red on there. And you can see there's a, there's a lot of overlap. So it clearly shows you graphically that there's potential for regional groundwater pollution from, from road salt. And the concern there is, is, is obvious when we think about human health and drinking water. And a lot of people have their own uh, private wells to draw their water from. So we don't actually have yet uh, data on groundwater. So our, our next best uh, measurement or indicator of groundwater pollution is looking at streams. So we'll take a look at that. 
So I'm going to show you some data from two projects that we've been working in uh, Blue Mountain Lake and Upper Saranac Lake for a number of years uh, for streams. So first we'll look at Upper Saranac Lake and I'm going to show you summer data. So May through October, the period where there's no salt being applied to the roads. And the average, this is the average of two years, 2015, 2016. So Black Brook, this is our reference watershed. We're looking at the chloride load from the watershed into, into the lake. Uh, less, uh, one pound of chloride per acre per year. So that's like the reference, no, no roads. If we compare that to one of the watersheds with paved roads, Cranberry Brook, which has State Route 3 running through it, the southern end of the lake, 44 pounds of chloride per acre. So 44 times higher chloride concentration or load going into the lake from Cranberry Brook. This is in the summer, right? So this isn't salt that's running off in the snowmelt like I showed you the picture of. This is salt that has accumulated in the soils and the groundwater over, over the decades and now is being loaded out into the lake. So this is a clear indicator of, of groundwater contamination or pollution. Same presentation for Blue Mountain, same period. So we have Beaver Brook is, is the no road reference condition. In this case, a little bit less than one, uh, one pound per acre. And Museum Brook, we have, you all been to the museum probably, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so Museum Brook, which has 28N state route running through it, has 22 pounds of chloride per acre. So again, same story, summertime. Why is it higher? Because salt has accumulated in the watershed and it's being released through contaminated, contaminated groundwater. This one's roughly half the, the load of the previous one because the road density is a little bit lower here than the previous one. So the load is lower. Another, another way we can look at uh, evidence of groundwater contamination is looking at base flow chloride concentration. So base flow is that minimum stream flow that you see in like late summer, early fall. So it hasn't rained all summer and the stream is still has water in it. Where's the water from? It's from groundwater. So if we grab a water sample during base flow, that's a groundwater sample and it gives us a good idea of a potential for groundwater contamination. And this data set, this is the combination of data from ASRA and, and Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute. So most of the data is up in the northeastern quadrant of the Adirondacks. A lot of it comes from the Austable River watershed and then a little bit down in the Blue Mountain Lake watershed. So we have the average base flow chloride concentration in parts per million and I have these ranked from the lowest just to the highest. Very simple uh, uh, graphical presentation. So the no paved roads ones are in blue and the paved road ones are in red. So we have 11 no paved roads. They're all less than 0.5 parts per million base flow. So this is consistent with what we saw for our lakes. This is what we'd expect given we just don't have the chloride in our geology. It's not coming down in precipitation. But when we look at the concentrations in our watersheds with paved roads, we see it ranges from anywhere from a low of three, which we would consider to be elevated uh, from human inputs, to a high of 195 parts per million, per million which is the Cranberry Brook uh, watershed in Upper, Ser Upper Saranac. And the variation here is, is would be mostly due to road density. So higher uh, base load concentration, or base load concentration, higher road density, lower, uh, lower road density. If road density is a surrogate, if, if you will, for, for uh, salt load. So we have strong evidence or clear evidence of surface water contamination, regional surface water contamination. We have linked it clearly to salting of state roads as the primary, uh, primary source of road salt into our surface water at the regional scale, and we have also very clear evidence of groundwater contamination as well. So just back to our take-home messages, we use a lot of salt. Again, New York uses the highest loading uh, application rates in North America. This has resulted in region regional salinization. Uh, it's likely impacting ecosystems. It's likely impacting groundwater but, or drinking water, but we don't know the extent of these impacts because they haven't been deliberately studied. Oh, we're working on it. And, and lastly, if we care about uh, these things, if, if folks in this room are alarmed and concerned, you have to act because as, as it will, it will be less and less. Last slide, one thing I, I did uh, is calculate the salt loads for each of the major watersheds in the Adirondacks. 
And so we're in the Otisable River watershed here. You see Chris Nowitzki wins. Uh, so Lake George wins. He, he already he won the prize. Uh, so so look, Chris probably already knew this, but Lake George has the highest salt loads. Hopefully they're going down. Uh, highest salt loading annually. Uh, Otisable River watershed, by virtue of road densities, has the second highest annual salt loads of, for all watersheds in the Adirondacks. So it's particularly uh, particularly uh, a concern for you, uh, given that your lows are so high, versus if you're if you're a resident of the Black Lake, Black the Black River watershed, where their lows are much lower. But you're in the higher range, higher end range because of higher road density. So these concerns should be higher in your radar, if you will. And that's it. I got that. <laughs> We've actually been working with them over the years, and we've had some impacts. We have, uh, Britain, you're probably, you can talk about our group? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but we actually have, um, when we published this paper back in 2000, the first paper that had showed the, the lake concentrations and the correlation with, with uh, state road density, we shared that with the, the DOT. We actually had a couple of conferences at Paul Smith College where we got stakeholders together and shared and discussed. Uh, we've had DOT at the table. They've actually made some changes. Uh, you may know that they reduced. They did reduce their salt application rates by 25%. They have reduced the speed of their trucks, which is important to keep the salt from bouncing off the road. The faster the truck goes, the more salt goes off the road, the more salt they have to put on the road to get the, what they need. Um, and they're also partnering with us on on, uh, on a series of tests watersheds looking at looking at some alternatives so so there is some work going on we've met with them in albany and i think you're going to maybe say more about that yeah. when you talk yeah so so yeah we've been doing we've been doing some things but more needs to be done thank you sure. okay we're going to continue